Welcome back to the Backrooms, a mind-bending reality consisting of endless liminal corridors hosting a diverse ecosystem of powerful organisms. If you don't know what the Backrooms are, you should definitely go watch my other stuff explaining it after this video, and subscribe, or I'll no-clip your balls off. With that done, let's take a look at the most skin-crawling entity I've seen in my expeditions. These, as you may know, are the Dentists, aka Entity 116. These wretched humanoids are a macabre fusion of decaying flesh, but only of tissue that usually makes up the gums, teeth, and jaws of a person. So imagine if instead of skin, the outside of you was just slimy, unflossed gums. The surface of its skin is lined with clustered sections of gum holes that could give even the most moist hole-obsessed pervert trypophobia. Some of these holes still have deadened teeth in place, although they're in various stages of gum rot. The head of the dentist is lined with teeth instead of hair. Would you rather have hair instead of teeth, or teeth instead of hair? Leave your answer in the comments, and I'll come do that to you. They have nothing resembling eyes, but instead sense the world through hearing. And they do it well enough to catch your dumb ass. Its cheeks have been cut from its lips to its ears, and sometimes its jaw has been snapped open, forming a ghastly permanent grin. Only one of this group, the Alpha, usually the largest, will have a complete set of teeth in their mouth. The end of the creature's arms are lined with sharp incisors and plier-like fingers made from what look like human molars. Entity 116 live in packs, looking for individuals to gang up on and then victimize, usually by surprise so they have no context of the situation. You are about to more deeply understand why these critters were deemed the dentists. When a pack of dentists encounter a wanderer, the majority of the group pin them down. The Alpha will place the sharp incisors of its arms at each corner of the victim's lips, snapping the jawbone and using his plier-like fingers to extract the teeth to replace ones it previously lost. It is possible to escape from a dentist encounter. However, it's better to avoid them altogether. You can usually hear a dentist approaching from a great distance away by its trademark sexy wet garbled heavy paint breathing. If the creature manages to touch you, you might as well call it quits on the whole life deal. The entirety of a dentist's body is coated in a thin layer of slimy mucus secreted from its gum tissue. It leaves a trail of this mucus wherever it walks, and contact with this infects an individual with a horrific oral disease. Their gums will begin to rot, and the roots of their teeth begin to radiate excruciating pain. It will then spread from the mouth. The surface of the human's entire skin will become incredibly sensitive, and begin to shed layers until it resembles gum tissue. Holes will begin to open up in sporadic clusters on the torso, but they'll be concentrated at the end of the limbs. Out of many of these holes burst teeth that extend from the bones like they were jaws. This is incredibly painful. If the individual doesn't die from this condition, it will spread to the brain, stunting the intellectual capacity of the individual, rendering them essentially another iteration of Entity 116. Eventually, the eyes will fall out, and the morphology of the face will shift so that the jaw is far further up the head. If a human goes through the dentist infection process without getting their face mutilated and encounters a wandering pack of dentists, the two with their mouth teeth intact will fight for dominance, and the winner will rip the teeth out of the loser and gore his face so he looks like the others. In the end, he's kind of doing him a favor. Remember, if you are in any way different from the norm, that's inherently bad, and you should feel bad about it. That's just a scientific fact. Oh yeah, and it had a weakness that I was gonna tell you about, but I forgot to write it down. I don't know, try dental floss, that would make sense. Nah, I'm just kidding. This thing isn't nearly as scary as the Glock Dookie or the reverse defecation bird. Let's take a look at more of the entities skulking through these halls. Wall worms are worms residing in the walls of the back rooms that can grow up to 30 feet in length. These worms resemble, but do not taste like, the common earthworm. They move in an unnatural, seemingly robotic pulsating rhythm. Someone please sample it and make me a wallworm type beat. Wallworms vary wildly in size, with possibly only the environment limiting how big they can get. Worms in level 0 and similar levels will be around 2 feet long, whereas levels with large uninterrupted sections of land can have wallworms as long as 20 feet in length. With unconfirmed reports of worms growing to be around the size of a few city blocks. Wallworms contain robotic cores in their interior which serve to animate them. 
These robotic engines differ from worm to worm and are usually in a rusty state of disrepair despite remaining functional. So no, unless you want tetanus in your vagetinus, you cannot stick these cores inside of there. Some wall worms have been described as a layer of skin, approximately one lambskin condom thick, stretched out around a cylindrical mass of electrical wires that extend from their core, while others have a small core buried deep within an extensive and otherwise natural mass of flesh. To date, no wallworm in captivity or otherwise has been observed to die of natural causes, but they can be killed easily by destroying this inner core. Aside from providing these electrical impulses that allow the wallworms to move, these corroded engines will also produce a corrosive, viscous slime of unknown chemical composition that allows wallworms to eat through almost anything. This residue displays highly acidic properties and is highly flammable, threatening to make entire colonies and outpost infrastructures unstable if a wallworm infestation is not dealt with immediately. Backroom's life hack: you can milk these worms and collect their acidic secretions in glass almond water containers. After you recover from milking your worm, plop a napkin in the top and light it on fire. Essentially, you have an acid bomb and a Molotov cocktail all in one. If the flesh of the wallworm is damaged or removed, it will be fully regenerated within a period of two days via chemical reaction that causes a wallworm's acidic slime to congeal and coalesce into new layers of skin. If you're desperate enough, you can carve out small sections of this worm and cook them for food, since they'll grow back. And you can basically use this creature like a living flesh farm. This is the Game Master. This entity is the only entity that inhabits level 389, aka the Gaming Hall. She resembles a human-sized doll with a jester hat and a dress, has stitched X's for eyes, appears to be suspended like a puppet, and because this is my video and you're obviously gonna make me do another Backroom Smasher Pass episode, I'm gonna make her bad as hell. Seriously, human, stop trying to make me fuck the Harley Quinn puppet. It's not funny, it's gonna get us both in trouble. This entity just likes to chill and play games. When playing a game with a survivor trapped inside level 389, the Game Master will always attempt to cheat without the player knowing. However, if called out on her breaking the rules, she will instantly be forced to stop. This same rule applies to the player. It is still unclear what actually happens when a game is lost. Her personality could be described as chaotic and unpredictable, where she will move around in gravity-defying mannerisms as well as her hands having the appearance of being tugged on slash around. She will typically be found tinkering with the game she creates and edits, or laying down on the ground like a rag doll. Pretty relatable, most of my day is spent doing one of those two things too. The Game Master will often go several hours or even days completely limp. While the Game Master exhibits control over the entire level, she cannot leave and claims to be trapped inside. It is assumed that she is a puppet in the literal sense, and something unknown to us is currently in control of her physical body. Alright, this is getting more and more sus by the moment, and that's exactly what I was worried about. The Game Master seems to have powerful telekinetic and reality-altering abilities, being able to create games that break the laws of physics and edit these games without making physical contact. In addition, Level 389 itself seems to move and change its layout to her will. Fortunately, she does not use these powers to harm survivors on this level, except a little bit in the fun way. Any photos taken of the Game Master will inexplicably show up as blank. Well, to you it's inexplicable because you don't have interdimensional internet and you haven't seen her post about content theft from her OnlyFans. Scorpses are scorpion-like creatures that like to remove heads from dead bodies and talk using their voices. Well, that's a pretty neat party trick, they can do a lot more than just your average talented puppeteer that just happens to use decapitated human heads. They can psychically project the deceased's memories. If they cannot find a pre-cut head to communicate with, they will use their club-like tails to bludgeon wanderers to death and use their heads for communication. They measure on average 10 feet or 3 meters long and weigh around 200 pounds. When they have a human head to speak through, they are about as intelligent as a regular human being. But without it, they are about as dumb as a regular scorpion. Once in possession of a human skull, scorpses are able to project mental images into the minds of anybody within a 50 feet radius. These images will be composed from memories belonging to the decapitated head, but are used by the scorpses to communicate through a vaguely understood pictographic language. The Scorpses will torture their victims with disturbing memories such as the deceased dying moments, hysterical shrieks and laughter, or images of a dead person fondling their bits to porn you didn't even know existed. However, as the brain matter within the skull continues to decompose, the entity will also begin to lose its enhanced intelligence until it is unable to project telepathic images and is returned to its baseline intelligence. When this happens, Scorpses will proceed to seek out another corpse which they can decapitate and use to start the cycle all over again. 
the circle of life never ceases to amaze and inspire me. That's it for this episode. If you want me to come back to back rooms and do more such things, make sure to like, comment, subscribe with all notifications enabled or I'll turn you inside out. These are the woodlands. They manifest as face-slash-humanoid-like carvings most commonly in wood. Woodlands are entities that visually manifest through the patterns found in plank wood, the interior of logs, or other materials that appear at least visually similar to wood. Its exact form varies, but generally it appears as a humanoid figure or face. They can also scrawl threatening or taunting messages in the wood. The woodlands verbal assaults consist of death threats and body shaming, but trying to cancel them by carving it into wood hasn't done any good. When exiting its surface, its physical body seems to be made from the material itself, and the entity becomes corporeal. The woodlands target wanderers that are losing their grip on reality. Now, there's a fine line between being paranoid and being cautious in a dangerous situation. A backroom's wanderer needs to be able to jump rope with it. If the target is mentally healthy, or at least as close as you can get in the backrooms, they'll stalk them for miles and make their presence known to induce paranoia. Once a wanderer is questioning the nature of their reality, the woodland will partially noclip out of the surface and grab them before pulling them inside and disappearing. The Wanderer will then be partially no-clipped inside of this material, severing whatever is in contact with the wall. Full vertical segmentation is lethal, but if the Woodland only manages to get a part of you in the wall, you can live if you amputate the appendage before it can drag you further inside. This seems like a rock in a hard place thing, cause it's either chainsaw off your genitalia or die. I don't know what I'd pick. Fun fact, the chainsaw was originally invented to make the removal of the pelvic bone easier and less time consuming during childbirth or any other time you'd need to remove a pelvic bone, I won't tell. This creature is the Strangler. Stranglers are furry bipedal hoofed creatures with a large beak and tentacle-like arms to coil around their victim's neck. Their entire anatomy is designed to minimize noise. They have spongy hooves and soundproof beaks to make sure bone crunches aren't too loud for them. They also tend to have a Doofenshmirtz-esque hunch, theorized to be a defense mechanism against other stranglers, as they have been seen standing completely straight, reaching a height of at least 8 feet tall. This extra height would make it difficult for other stranglers to attack. Stranglers reside in level 58.1, a dimly lit and very dangerous level. Like the town drunk, stranglers only seem to become violent during blackouts. Blackouts are when all of level 58.1's lights shut off in unison for a seemingly random amount of time. Like a desperate man at a rave, they skulk throughout the dark room, feeling for anything with a pulse. They then grab whatever they find and squeeze it until it stops struggling and begin to consume it. These creatures will do this to their own kind as well. I'm not sure how they reproduce, but regardless, it's definitely a lot of choking with the lights off. I regret nothing. When the lights turn on, all stranglers flip shit due to sensory overload and scramble back to their dens, dark holes they contort into and hide in till the next blackout. Stranglers are just afraid of loud noises, so if the level blacks out, just and they won't come near you. The reverse defecation bird. Just when you think you've seen it all, in walks a bird that unshits itself. People are gonna think I made this shit up. I didn't make this shit up. I wish I made this shit up. You can go to the wiki and check. Instances of Entity 40 are extremely common, almost invasive species to the backrooms. Visually, instances of Entity 40 just resemble typical pigeons that would be found populating rather urban and lived in environments of most western towns and cities. While initially coming across as extremely basic, almost one-to-one -one replicas of typical birds, the rather numerous instances of Entity 40 possess one distinctly differential and somewhat disturbing characteristic. Sometimes something is just so gold that no jokes about it will even hit the same, so I'm just gonna read this straight from the wiki with very little embellishment. Instances of Entity 40 unshit themselves. Yes, they absorb crap on the ground and bring it back into their own bodies. They are known to force feed from the ground back into their own rear during periods of flight. Instances of Entity 40 have the somewhat unsightly and morbid ability to suddenly cause previously dropped bird excrements to quickly shoot up and become a part of them. My god, I love it. This is unironically my favorite entity so far. How this process is done is unknown, and any investigation is proved fruitless. Sometimes people can get hit at such great speeds with this entity's feces that it can prove lethal. To the untrained eye, it may seem almost impossible to detect when bird droppings may rip upwards towards the sky, or which droppings are ones that can rip up into the heavens. A few seconds before the droppings are going to depart from the ground, they will often act like a magnet towards the bird in question, with any looser parts on the ground lifting or moving up towards the creature, usually happening about 10 seconds before the process occurs. Oh yeah, and there's like a goat that eats popsicles. Entity 666, aka Happy Files, is a string of several websites on the backroom's internet that host instances
instances of an anomalous, seemingly sentient computer virus disguised as various applications. Instances of Entity 666 often masquerade as Backrooms file sharing sites such as fileshare.backrooms and piratebay.backrooms, or video sharing sites such as youtube.backrooms or pornhub.backrooms. These web pages all share the same name, only differentiated by a set of random numbers within the URL. You can only get onto the Backrooms internet in the Backrooms or with a powerful force known as suspension of disbelief. Like a toilet seat for gonorrhea, these websites are basically just the carrier for the Entity 666 virus. When an individual is downloading the desired program from any variant of Happy Files, it will instead download as a zip file. Once extracted, there will be an unzipped folder containing a TXT file stating, Thank you for downloading this program. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you for using Happy Files. Along with a .exe file with a lower quality version of the original icon for the specified program. Once the .exe has been opened, the individual will now be designated Entity 666-A. The program will be an exact replica of the original counterpart of the specified program with no limitations or paywalls, so if you're willing to put up with this spectral technical crap, you can just get a lot of these free cursed softwares. If the program is a utility type program, there will be an icon displaying the face of Entity 666. If the program is a video game, soon after being opened, the player will spot a digital instance of Entity 666, which will begin to follow them slowly before pursuing at great speed, jump scaring the player. Immediately following this, it will crash the computer and shut down all electronics in the room, including any lights, computers, or vibrators. It will then manifest in the room as an obsidian-colored humanoid entity standing roughly 2.1 meters or 6 foot 8. It has a white porcelain-like face sporting sunken yet somehow bulging, unblinking eyes and an unnaturally cavernous smile. This face never changes in any iteration of Entity 666. Even when I tell him that he has the vibes of the guy at the party who tells everybody to add him on FetLife, he refuses to wipe the stupid grin off of his face. This instance will begin to travel to Entity 666A at a steady and slow pace, and gradually pick up speed. When Entity 666 reaches Entity 666A, it will again jump scare Entity 666A in hopes of causing a heart attack. If Entity 666A has a strong stomach and doesn't suffer a heart attack, Entity 666 will rip all of the wanderer's limbs off and just tell its friends that they died of a heart attack because dead men tell no tales. The file containing Entity 666 will then delete itself from the computer. Alright, fuck it. I want to play some Red Dead. Then I like totally scared him until he had a heart attack. <laughs> Oh my god, dude. Next up are the skinless. The skinless, as the name suggests, are humanoid figures that look as though they've been skinned with surgical precision, revealing the inner workings of their anatomical structures such as their muscle fibers, bones, vascular systems, and organ structures. They ooze a strange fluid behind them, and when examined more closely, it seems to be a mix of every type of human bodily fluid. Yes, every type. Even, even that one. While these creatures resemble humans somewhat in their passive state, when they enter their active state around human prey, they exhibit some very inhuman characteristics. For example, when they see a wanderer, they will stalk it for miles until it can get close enough undetected to strike. The entity will then split open its torso at the rib cage and open up using the ribs like some sort of spooky skeleton bear trap. It will then grab the wanderer swiftly, snap the trap shut with a force on par with the bite of an alligator skewering and trapping the victim in its chest cavity. The veins of the skinless will then detach and move like tendrils to the bleeding holes created by the sharp ribs, and they will weave their way inside of the veins and arteries, digestive system, nervous system, reproductive system, hell, anywhere the wanderer has body fluid. They will then drain the victim of all their blood, saliva, stomach acid, naughty fluid respective to the victim's sex. They have also been seen laying down with their rib cage open like some sort of horrific mouse trap to pierce the legs of an unassuming wanderer for an easy meal. <laughs> You're all still asking a lot of questions, which I told you not to do, so maybe I'll answer one. What the hell are you? Why are you milking the back rooms? Why haven't you seeked the psychological evaluation that you very obviously need? To be honest, if I see a therapist, I might not be able to connect to my mentally ill audience members. Chances are, that's a significant portion of my demographic. Embracing insanity has done wonders for my mental health. Level Run For Your Life, aka Level Exclamation Point, is a long hallway around 10 
kilometers or a little over six miles long. Wanderers can enter this level by using elevators in the back rooms, they can awaken there if they pass out from substance abuse, or just randomly when they least expect it. This hallway resembles that of a broken down crack house of a hospital, down to every last bloody rusted syringe and mysterious bodily fluid puddle. Except there's a constant red flashing light and blaring alarm noise. Immediately upon entry, the wanderer will hear the bloodthirsty shrieks of a horde of murderous entities approaching at Usain Boltian speeds from a long distance down the hallway. These entities include skin stealers, smilers, butthole fondlers, etc. The only way a wanderer can survive is by running the full distance of the hallway and making it to the end. The wanderer will have to evade hospital beds, medical devices, and even clumps blocking the way. If you see another wanderer running, you can trip them and feed the horde for a few more seconds of space. Who's gonna tell? Not that guy. There's also almond water and food scattered around, so if you're like a marathon sprinter, you can stop and have a snack and a drink. Any doors on the sides of the halls are locked. Don't try opening them or breaking them down. Your frail human arms can't interfere with these unknown forces. It'll just waste the time that you desperately need for running from the living wave of monsters that wants to turn you into nutrients. If an especially fit wanderer manages to get to the end, there will be an exit door that leads to a random level, which hopefully isn't just a void. To be real with y'all, I think I think if we dropped every one of my subscribers into this level, around 95% of them would die within the first two miles, but hey, maybe I'm wrong. Adrenaline is a phenomenal drug. Let's get into it. Ready? Go! Welcome to the end of the back rooms. After fighting through hordes of entities, traversing an inordinate amount of hazardous levels, and finally smashing the Game Master, you've pulled up to what looks to be the very last level of this insanity-inducing hellhole. That's right, according to some, this seemingly infinite dimension actually has an end to it. Level 922337203685477507807 is what humans consider to be the final true level of the back rooms. This number number is the 64-bit integer limit on a computer, and because y'all are obsessed with simulation technology, the theory is that the back rooms are a simulated reality. Look dude, I've been there. When you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You humans realize that you're the ones categorizing this. Just because you found carpet land first and called it zero, doesn't mean a literal dimension gives any semblance of a shit where you started counting, right? Your species logic consistently confounds me. This is one of the hardest to enter and most dangerous levels in the back rooms. It looks like a simple, cold, brutalist staircase, around 29 steps tall, that leads upward into an end. Like the frostbitten end of a homeless man's phallus he aimed towards the sky at 7 in the goddamn morning on the sunset strip, the color of the end is not humanly describable. The most one can compare it to is black or white. It is void of any color, so empty that looking directly at it for too long can make humans begin to cry. But I think it's pretty fucking hot. The space continues for at least billions of miles in all directions. Beyond this void is rumored to be the front rooms. However, stupid human ape technology has not yet reached a point in which you can breach this void to escape. This is the final level known to man. No official number can be beyond it. I mean, what did you expect? If you can't get past the void, you're not gonna find it. Just because you can't find it, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. That's like not looking to your right and then assuming nothing other than left exists. I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. Human-made cameras have trouble processing this void, as they are terrible at capturing literally anything interesting other than nudes, and sometimes not even then. It is currently rumored that this fake reality, the end, could be a decoy or secret entrance to the true end. There is one exit to this dimension, the elevator right before the staircase. If the elevator opens for you, there are many buttons in the elevator that can take you to all sorts of different places, one of them being level zero. All sorts of entities congregate closer to the end itself to try to find an escape. Either that or they're just playing ooky cooky into the void. The crowds of these dangerous creatures are massive and are often an obstacle to accessing the pit. There is but one entity that lives in the void itself, but it lurks so deeply within the void that there is only one known part to it. It has a long chameleon tongue-like appendage that it uses to snatch entities on the brink of the end before sucking them off into the void for an unknown process that is assumed to be a process similar to digestion. Nah, I'm just kidding. This part was a complete goof that I used so I can look out there unimpeded by the crowds of morons. 
Snatcher weeds are crimson plants that can be found on the grounds of most outdoor and some indoor levels of the back rooms. When planted, they maintain a crimson color, but they turn black when they are unrooted from the ground. These weeds curl up into tight clumps when in its passive state, and can stretch out five to seven feet when in the presence of prey. Snatcher weeds have been described as strangely sticky, and that's not something I added, it was taken directly from the wiki, so it's not just me being a pervert this time. Wanderers have also reported an odd sensation akin to burning. This burning sensation from the weeds has caused them to be used in many forms of strange Uncanny Valley versions of BDSM. These entities are also known to be able to release toxins similar to the consumption of liquid pain, which is exactly what it sounds like. Unlike Cali weed, Entity 143 leaves are incredibly sharp, capable of causing lacerations and dismemberment. The stems are covered in small, sharp thorns as well. Although difficult due to their variation in length and thickness, it is possible to cut snatcher weeds off. Doing so will cause them to harden, which makes snatcher weeds very useful weapons for those lucky enough to cut a satisfying amount of stem. Snatcher weeds act like normal weeds when not within a five foot radius of wanderers or entities. However, when the targets are within range, like a man on bath salts who sees a delicious face, the behavior of the weeds becomes erratic. Some, like me, do not get harmed by the snatcher weeds at all, because because they know I'll just roll them up and smoke them if they try. Skin givers are creatures with blood red skin, white sunken eyes, and skeletal arms with hundreds of layers of thick skin on the hands. Since the majority of their weight is in their hands, they move in a chimp-like knuckle-walking fashion. While these wet dreams for those with an elephant titus fetish are extremely strong, they move slowly and methodically. These creatures have the ability to apply extra layers of skin to anything their hands make physical contact with. The skin will grow and wrap around the victim, causing itchiness and heat to the real layer of skin. Imagine your entire body becoming biologically uncircumcised, and it's basically like that. Once contact is made, the skin giver will slowly chase the affected person. Over time, more and more layers of skin will grow on the victim until they pass out due to heat exhaustion. When unconscious, the skin giver will tear open the new layers of skin and eat the flesh of the wanderer. The remaining skin will be left to rot behind. Analysis of this extra skin has revealed that it is almost entirely made from scrotal slash foreskin. These entities have a mutualistic relationship with skin stealers, as they often congregate, and the skin stealer will alleviate some of the weight on the hands of the skin giver by taking the excess skin to patch up their own wounds. This symbiosis was partially the basis for the theory that evolution is at least partially also how life came to be in the back rooms, and also this t-shirt. Next up are the Curabita birds. The Curabita bird is a large avian that looks like it huffs glue out of a bag. Couldn't possibly be more than goldfish level intelligence behind these eyes. Well, that's not very nice, a picture. This cross between a glow stick, a soap bubble, and a dodo bird can be found in any level that contains a decent sized death moth population, as they survive off of the smaller male death moths. They use a long sticky tongue to snag their prey and slurp it back inside of their face hole. Humans have attempted to use this tongue for exactly what you're thinking, and I'm happy to say it went exactly as poorly as you would think. Other than that, they are mostly harmless when it comes to interactions with humans, as they will flee like a little bitch if they notice any creature larger than themselves. They are extremely slow, only able to locomote by flapping their nearly vestigial wings to pathetically doggy paddle through the air. The Curabita bird is almost always in a nearly completely dormant state. They can spend days at a time floating in a single spot, only snapping into action when a perceived threat draws too close, or when a male death moth comes into contact with their tongue. Like a deep sea guppy to the glow of an angler's dangler, or EDP to a cupcake, the death moth is attracted to the bioluminescent tip of the Curabita bird's tongue, and will get stuck in the highly adhesive saliva that coats it. Perhaps the most striking feature of the Curabita bird is the bioluminescent gel which it stores in the hump on its back. Despite the fact that this gel is semi-solid, it is significantly lighter than air, allowing this strange creature to stay airborne almost indefinitely. You can actually use this to fly, but the caveat is you have to shove a few gallons of bird fluid up your ass. When extracted from the Curabita bird, the gel will maintain its light-giving properties for up to several days. This window of usefulness can be extended almost indefinitely when the gel is exposed to a significant amount of heat. This means that a jar of Curabita gel could serve as a constant light source in warmer levels of the back rooms. I've eaten it. Fucked me up real good, although it's pretty toxic for humans. Oh yeah, and also there's this hermit crab that instead of claws has pool noodles. 
and he, he sucks you. Entity 36, known as Cannibal Cuisine, is an anomalous type of vending machine found within the back rooms. They can look like any sort of front rooms brand vending machines. On the back of these machines always reads a tag, Cannibal Cuisine Productions, Iris Family, from humans, by humans, for humans. As of now, no one has a goddamn clue who the Iris Family is or if they even exist at all. Cannibal Cuisines are supernaturally durable and cannot be destroyed using normal methods. <laughs> These machines don't require any payment to operate, and the internal systems seem to be a blend of biological and mechanical. For example, instead of a metal coil pushing the product off the shelf and into the slot, this system uses a skeletal human hand. And instead of a button, like a human, you would use the clit to turn it on. I regret absolutely f***ing nothing. All products made from Entity 36 are made from human parts. And like a noble hunter-gatherer should, Entity 36 uses all parts of the animal. Some of my favorites from these vending machines include small blocks of flesh, wrapped sloppily with a candy bar wrapper, entire heart, carbonated blood with sugar added, dick in a box, chip bag containing chips made from human bone marrow, skin strips dipped in gum, and my favorite, the fermented alcoholic piss. Every 12 hours, the products within a cannibal cuisine will all be instantaneously replenished, appearing out of thin air. Products that have not been taken will simply remain inside. While safe to consume for most multidimensional entities, products from Entity 36 spike human dopamine levels so much that humans can get instantly instantly addicted to these products. Addicted individuals devote themselves to obtaining as much food as they can from the cannibal cuisines and are willing to risk their lives to do so. What's that saying? Crack addiction doesn't give a shit whether or not you think you're gay? Multiple wanderers that are victim to the same instance of Entity 36 may also attempt to harm one another to ensure more food for themselves. Normal side effects of high amounts of dopamine include euphoria, binge eating, addiction, poor impulse control, heightened aggressiveness… Oh shit. Besides generally inciting an extreme feeling of joy, products from cannibal cuisines may also cause a few other effects. For example, the complete and permanent removal of any prior memories pertaining to cannibal cuisines. Any further information on the entity is wiped from the victim's memory after an average of four hours. They will also be unable to eat other sources of food and water, including almond water. Attempting to eat non-Entity 36 food items will result in the food remaining in the stomach and not leaving via digestion unless removed by other means. They'll also have increased hunger and thirst, regardless of the amount of food the victim has consumed. Sometimes they even hear voices emanating from the cannibal cuisines, which become more and more prevalent during the machine's replenishment and the consumption of a product. These voices are often described as blood-curdling screams, soft yet discomforting sobs, and or coming noises. Most victims recall that these voices manifest in the form of a loved one from their past life before entering the back rooms. Oxids are small, bronze-colored arthropods native to level 61, although they have been sighted on other levels. Eyewitnesses have compared them to crabs or pubic lice, albeit much larger and with sharper mandibles. Oxids scurry around various levels searching for objects made out of base metals, such as copper or iron. Much like a snake, they have two glands in the back of their mouths. However, instead of venom, these produce an unidentified acid with the ability to spread rust and oxidation. Once an oxid finds such an object, it will use its acidic saliva to corrode the metal for much easier consumption. If you ask an oxid what that mouth do, the answer would be dissolve. These rusted metals compose its entire diet. Oxids are naturally curious entities and will search any bags, containers, or fleshy orifices for something to eat. Tupperware is recommended as a way to keep them out of your belongings, as plastic does not oxidize. Oxids have strong mandibles to help chew up the rusted metal they live on. However, they will use these in combat if they feel threatened or just bored and sadistic. I'm warning you. I never warn you guys, so you know this is gonna be bad. This entity is cursed. And I'm warning you now because the following content is so foul it goes far beyond the not-for-human-consumption nature of most of the cognito hazards I upload. With that being said, allow me to introduce the most cursed entity in the entire backrooms. The Glock Dookie. This entity empties out a toothpaste tube, fills it with its own feces, urine, seminal fluid, and vomit, and then proceeds to aim the front of the toothpaste tube towards a victim. It will squeeze the end of the tube so as to squirt the contents of the tube out rapidly. This mixture cannot be removed once it touches a person. No known substance can wash the Glock Dookie off. This entity will display different tendencies while in large groups. They've been reported to mass Glock Dookie a victim and then knock out the wanderer with blunt force trauma, pull down their pants, 
pants and scream, get that ass. Soon, a swarm of entities appear and spread the wanderer's ass cheeks open, subsequently spitting into the anus of the unconscious victim. This entity is not cataloged in the wiki or the fandom, and the only place one can find an account of these entities is in a video that I will be linking in the description. It's canon now and there's not a single fucking thing any of you can do about it. Also, this is the not goldfish, it swims through the air. I'm gonna give you all an AZFK fun fact. I'm 100 meters from your location and approaching rapidly. Start running! Wallpaper wraiths are giant slug-like creatures that stick to walls and ceilings using a red mucus secretion. Their skin is covered in advanced chromatophores, which can replicate the patterns and colors of the walls and ceilings with great accuracy. While this seems like a powerful ability, you can use this to your advantage by leading them to stick to walls with hate symbols and then get them cancelled. These creatures hunt by sneaking up on their prey and extending a tendril-like tongue. They will wrap this tongue around the victim, like any skilled murderer, starting with the mouth to silence any screaming. After encasing the prey completely, they will either retract the tongue and eat the victim whole, making every mollusk vorophile's dream come true, or drag the prey back into the nest to leave it for its young. Injuring a wallpaper wraith will cause them to spit a paralyzing black liquid that will freeze any entity or wanderer in place, making them incredibly easy to consume. The tongue of these creatures is easily capable of snapping a human neck. Wallpaper wraith's ears are extremely sensitive, and if the entity hears a loud noise, it'll just straight up have a heart attack and die. Boo! Ah! These creatures usually nest inside of the ceilings, the females laying hundreds of eggs until they literally die from exhaustion from it, like a termite queen or the man chicken. When the young wraiths hatch, they will eat the stash of food, red dead bodies, left by their parents, and then they'll eat their siblings. When there are only about seven left, they will proceed to find their own spots for nests, and then they will start hunting to begin the process all over again. Nature be so beautiful sometimes. I mean, like, not right now. This is awful. But I don't know, man. Go outside. Reviooks are entities that physically remain mysterious, although there is much evidence to their existence and the destruction that their behavior leaves on its surroundings. Reviooks will burrow into the ground for several weeks at a time, waiting for wanderers or other entities to walk over them. They have the miraculous ability to heal the ground after they submerge themselves in it, leaving no trace of the destruction that got them underground. After a few seconds of a victim standing over the Reviook, it will burst from the ground, grab the victim, and quickly resubmerge to give them the big subterranean suck. The victim is either crushed by the ground or suffocated within minutes, and then the Reviook will consume the victim, then coughing up an owl pellet-like waste product useful in teaching children about anatomy. The exact physical appearance of the Reviook is unclear, as they spend most of their existence underground. However, humans have a rough idea of what they look like. They have large muscular arms in the front, and three small legs in the back. Their feet have a spork-like shape, allowing them to rapidly dig themselves under the ground. The head has eight black beady eyes arranged similarly to that of a spider, and just below these are a proboscis-like mouth, which makes this creature a low-hanging fruit for BJ jokes. Males will have large white dots on their body, while females will have several tiny white dots. The splat is an amorphous flesh blob with a thick liquid-like consistency. Contain your orgasms, folks. It has several eyes which move around the body before popping back in in a manner that is described to be similar to boiling. These creatures cling to the ceilings of level zero behind doors, waiting for a stupid wanderer to stumble under them. They will make splooshing noises, and apparently it's to attract prey. I'm not saying you won't attract someone, but you're going to attract a very particular and likely very sticky type of someone. When someone enters the door, the splat will latch onto their neck and inject what the wiki calls a poison, but anyone with half a brain knows when it's injected, it's a venom. This venom will cause hallucinations and extreme nausea. I've tried it before for fun, and it wasn't very fun, and I can usually get into nightmarish hallucinations. Most notably, the victim will believe the small room they are trapped in is another hallway, stretching on forever. In the state of their confusion, the victim will inadvertently trap themselves in the room until they die, either from starvation, dehydration, or suicide. The corpse is assumed to be eaten by the entity. If you spot a splat, walk past it slowly. Act natural, but not too natural. And don't run, as like the common movie T-Rex, their vision is based on movement, and they seem to be attracted to fast-moving objects. You're scared, coward! You got man enough to f with me! You can't last two minutes in my world, bitch! Look at you scared now, you ho! Scared of the real man. I'll f till you love me. I had to get high. I had to back. I had to get high. 
I'm not sure if this is the weirdest backrooms entity I've ever seen, but it's definitely up there. Entity 161, more commonly known as Leon, is a toddler-sized leech with a pair of long noodle-like boneless arms that end in little points instead of hands. At the very front of his body, he has a ring-shaped mouth filled with three large sharp teeth. No matter what climate one finds this entity in, his skin is somehow constantly wet and slippery, leaving a visible trail of mystery fluid as he slithers around. No valuable scientific data was gathered by forcing a series of humans to drink varying amounts of it. This entity is always adorned in a white collar, a multicolored necktie, and white tuxedo cuffs placed slightly above the points of his arms. Do not insult his tie. He'll take it very personally. He's also always seen with an exaggeratedly tall and skinny light brown top hat. With him, Leon carries a black leather briefcase which he uses to store items he's collected. Despite looking like a standard briefcase, it's able to store objects significantly larger than both it and Leon himself. This entity has been known to function as a wandering salesman of sorts and is fully capable of human speech. However, his teeth are so large that he can't seem to close his mouth over them, causing him to have a permanent lateral lift. What the hell did you put me on the show for? I wish one of your guys had children so I could kick them in their fucking head or stomp on their testicles so you could feel my pain because that's the pain I have waking up every day. If a wanderer encounters him, he will usually make an attempt to peddle a small variety of items to whomever he stumbled upon in exchange for the person's blood. Offering Leon another bodily fluid results in him contacting the authorities. These items can range greatly in value, consisting of anything from random junk to highly sought after objects such as royal rations, life insurance, or mescaline. Leon is generally friendly with wanderers, if not also kinda slick. If a wanderer happens to encounter this entity or vice versa, he'll make an immediate attempt to strike up conversation and temporarily join the wanderer on their travels or duties. He'll accompany the wanderer until he's either successfully sold them an item, been shooed off, or simply decided to go somewhere else all on his own. During the times in which Leon is conversing with a wanderer, he'll often make attempts to shift the conversation to the topic of his wares in hopes of making a sale. Leon's not really my friend, he just wants my business. Should the wanderer agree to his products, he'll open up the briefcase and advertise a selection of four to five items that usually range in quality and usefulness. While Leon claims to not be a drug dealer, he does sell drugs. The standard prices of items seem to be completely random, but it is possible to haggle with Leon in order to make a desired item cheaper. At the moment, no pattern on what items Leon deems as valuable has been discovered. I found the man's once, and he was selling a new iPhone for the same price as a rotten apple core. No semblance of value at all. It's important to keep in mind not to touch an item unless you're absolutely sure you want to buy it. For whatever reason, Leon considers any item that has been touched bought, and will subsequently claim his payment whether you're willing or not. Sounds like Leon needs to take the those online courses that they make every college freshman take. Instead of accepting any form of currency or trade for his items, this entity only accepts payment in the buyer's blood. Whenever one decides to purchase an item, Leon's hat will briefly shudder before the top flips open and spurts a purple gas cloud in the face of the buyer like some sort of Alice in Wonderland Nightman version of a Dr. Seuss book. This gas will completely knock out most wanderers approximately 15 to 20 seconds after inhalation. When the buyer is unconscious, Leon will then proceed to plunge his three teeth into one of the shoulders of the buyer and consume the amount of blood he's owed, using a blood-sucking method similar to that of an actual leech. It's believed the gas his hat spits out is supposed to function as an anesthesia, so the buyer doesn't have to feel their blood being sucked out. It's an instant knockout for humans, but for higher level species it's kinda like getting hit with a dentist gas. <laughs> When finished with the payment process, Leon will leave the area and the buyer will wake up about 10 minutes later with a Y-shaped scar on one of their shoulders, a mild soreness in the arm with the scar, and the purchased item sitting on the ground nearby. This entity is a pussy pacifist and will flee at high speeds if the situation gets violent. If cornered, he'll usually resort to hitting the aggressor with a puff of his knockout gas before frantically scrambling away. The only other times Leon gasses something without an agreed sale comes if one tries to steal something from him, as he'll very often manage to knock out any attempted thief with his gas before they can get away. Afterwards, he'll take both the payment for the item and the item itself back. Despite his generally pacifistic nature, Entity 161 has unintentionally killed some wanderers in the past by taking too much blood all at once. He doesn't seem to be aware of the fact that creatures actually need blood to survive. Having stated, they can always just grow more. I mean, like, he's not wrong. However, he does seem to favor specific blood types over others. He'll very often bring up blood types as an icebreaker conversation, and seems to generally lower his prices for types that he favors. Currently, it is believed that his favorite blood type is B positive, while his least favorite is O positive. See, I don't even normally use blood for biological functions, but I allocate resources to make it just so I can get more X from the backroom slug dealer. Well that, and I just throw humans to him for stuff and he doesn't seem to mind. 
Who are you? Where am I? What is this place? Congratulations, sir. You've won a free safari tour of the back rooms and have been no clipped out of reality at no cost to yourself to claim your prize. That's cool and all, but I'm diabetic and need to get my insulin. This creature is known as Entity 116. Entity 116, aka the dentists, are humanoids made out of what looks like an amalgamation of exposed rotting flesh, teeth, jaw, and gum tissue. Basically, just imagine that your entire skin was made out of your mouth, and that's what we're dealing with. While this might sound morbid, just think of it as their entire body being a smile. Yeah, that doesn't help for me either, honestly makes it kind of worse. They leave a trail of slimy mucus secreted from their gum tissue, which causes a horrific fatal oral disease if touched. Dentists are reported to smell like the bodies that are not in my cellar. These creatures are incredibly hostile, following their prey, pinning them down, and stealing their teeth and gums while they're still conscious. These creatures are usually very slow, but be wary as they have a huge burst of speed when a prey item gets within pouncing distance. Next up are the Combine, a big old centipede made out of human parts. They usually have human hair running down the length of their body, but I shaved this one because it looks cute that way. Their legs look like double-bent human fingers tipped with chitinous photoreceptors to snuffle around their surroundings. The weird finger things can also vomit up digestive pouches for digestive purposes. Like many species, they can drop parts of their body when in danger and grow them back later. If you feel threatened, remember to rip off all of your own limbs. It's very distracting. There's scavengers that eat mold or decaying biological materials, so they don't usually attack people. Keyword, usually. It's not opposed to going for someone if they're asleep, so just be wary of where you rest your head. How the hell does someone sleep in the back rooms? This entity is a strange combination of small mollusk-like creatures that all function as one unit. They give birth to young by shooting babies out of their legs. Like most methods of animal reproduction, this lands in the sweet spot between gross and beautiful. Some colonies of survivors in the back rooms have tamed these creatures like pets. I'm not allowed to go to Petco no more because the employee thought it was an innuendo when I kept asking for the finger centipede. Slightly more dangerous is the Smiler. The f are you looking at? The Smiler is a mysterious entity that stalks wanderers in the back rooms. They're often seen from a distance hiding in only the darkest areas, like a pervert. They stand out from the blackness with their glowing white eyes and radiant teeth bent into a wicked smile. They're attracted to light and will attempt to destroy any light source they come across. They're usually solitary hunters, but sometimes will travel in packs. As per their Tinder bio, their favorite method of dispatching a victim is via asphyxiation. Hey, yo, bitch, you like it rough? I choke out of the plastic rings on a sea turtle. Victims of a Smiler attack can be identified by swelling or damage around the throat, deep nail impressions, and unhealthy romantic habits. If the person they are stalking makes it into a bright area, they will retreat into the distance and stalk the wanderer from that distance. Some have reported Smiler stalkings for as long as one human gestation period. They relish in torturing the wanderers they stalk, hence that stupid fucking grin plastered on its face. Most of their body remains hidden in the darkness, so we don't really know what these things look like other than the face. Some think it's a ghost, some think it's a snaky thing, some think it's just one giant limb for strangulation. You're not scary, it's actually pretty pathetic to pick on humans. I remember you from reform school, Jeremy. <laughs> These blob creatures are called bone thieves. They have toad-like bumpy yellow skin that's impervious to damage. They're mostly stationary creatures that hunt by replicating human noises and language to lure victims close enough to strike. It's theorized that they're able to recreate almost any voice using an extremely developed larynx and vocal cords. No one knows how people become boneless when they get near the bone thieves, but they know it's an extremely fast and pretty clean process, because they end up looking like a plastic CVS bag made out of human skin. No hole, no blood, no nothing but a body puddle. They're there are only two entities powerful enough to be capable of this mysterious trickery. Their mouths open extremely wide to reveal a set of eyes in their throats. They have two holes on the sides of their head where normal eyes would be, but those just leak some strange blue fluid that coats their entire body. There's no gums or teeth inside the gullet, just an empty black soulless void in that set of beady little eyes. After all the victim's bones are gone, the bone thieves distend their jaws and swallow the boneless human nugget whole, and then don't eat for a while. In a similar vein to the Bone Thieves are the Skin Stealers. Skin Stealers are entities that feed on human skin and flesh. It wears the skins of its past victims as a disguise. It's also capable of mimicking human speech, but it's not capable of understanding it. This thing has clear blood, so if you're not sure if it's a Skin Stealer or a person, stab it. If it bleeds clear and sprints away, it's a Skin Stealer. If it bleeds red, hysterically screams, cries, and stops moving, it's probably a human. Skin Stealers have huge white sunken eyes. When the Skin Stealer murderlates a victim, it wears the skin for a 
about a day. After a period of around 24 hours, the skin will be digested through the surface of the skin stealer's real skin, and the skin stealer will enter a docile state cause it's no longer hangry. Hey, you look like that guy from earlier. Has no one checked if I'm just really drunk and looking for the bathroom? This is the stalker. Stalkers target lonely wanderers in the back rooms. They're masterful at disguising their bodies and voices to look like that of loved ones, friends, or other survivors, similar to the skills of their digital cousin, the catfisher. The longer you have gone without human contact, the more susceptible you are to a stalker's illusions and manipulations. A stalker's true form is a tall, sinewy, skeletal humanoid with tightly wrapped white leathery skin and two giant red eyes. It has long floppy fingers and toes that end in claws. Its mere presence induces nostalgia in dreams of the person's life before the back rooms. They like to season the meat of their human victims with betrayal, by acting as a loved one before striking to gain the trust of their prey. They will betray you in whatever manner makes you feel the worst based on what they've learned about you personally during the time that you thought you knew them. While this sounds bad, I know humans who operate the exact same way. They've been reported to work together and coordinate to break down an entire society of survivors. To feed, it uses a massive proboscis which comes out of its face to inject digestive enzymes into the human body. It takes a few days to digest the victim, so it'll hide it in the closet until its internal organs have putrefied into a black sludge so it can slurp it out of your now juice box of a body. This liquid entity is not water. Well, it's not not water. Well, it, it is not water, but it's more than just not water. It's a sentient self-aware liquid with an extensive knowledge of the back rooms. Drinking the not water connects you to the entity's consciousness, as well as connecting you psychically to everyone who has drank the not water. This is both useful and dangerous because it gives you useful information, but it also drives you 100% but insane. To demonstrate, we have an ethically sourced human test subject right here. I just peed on this COVID test. I'm definitely pregnant. I wonder if anyone has ever been murdered with the binging with Ravis Branch chef. Knife. You shouldn't have the thighs of a pregnant 15 year old. I subsist solely on bugs that I scrounge up from the ground. <laughs> If you end up drinking it, the entity will communicate with you, but you might not be able to hear it clearly over the shrieking voice of everyone else who drank it. This entity can control your mind, but usually it doesn't bother with anything like that. A good way to fix a not water afflicted brain is by removing it. This liquid is pee, and it is mine. A less threatening and actually helpful backrooms liquid is almond water. Almond water is the main source of hydration and survival in the backrooms. It can be found in bottles, cartons, cans, flowing through some of the pipes into water fountains on certain levels, even those weird squishy toys, you know the ones. The ones that have that hole that runs through the middle. What are those called again? A jellyfish snake wiggler. It is literally in the name. That is not just me. I'm not the perverted one. You're the perverted one. You give flashlights to your children. There's rarely any label or indication that it's almond water, so you gotta figure that out on your own. This liquid can be identified by a vanilla rose smell, which is important because there's other stuff that you can drink that'll just kill you or worse. Go by the rhyme. If it's vanilla and rose, trust your nose. If it's any other other smell, prepare yourself for hell. It's reported to taste like a sweet vanilla mint rose water. I don't know why the fuck they call it almond water. Almond water can be used as a curative for many diseases native to the back rooms. For example, it can prevent human beings from turning into a wretch. Humans can turn into a wretch when they succumb to a lack of food, water, and sleep and become vulnerable to the poorly understood wretch cycle. Wretches are completely insane zombie-like creatures that have inhuman strength and hunt humans in packs using rudimentary handmade weapons. If you don't want to become one of these, drink your goddamn almond water. Moving on to a slightly less moist but much more dangerous topic, this is carpet moss. I mean, you can't see it, but trust me, it's there. It's located on level zero and looks almost indistinguishable to the damp carpet that covers the floor of the level, except for a thin layer of clear gelatinous adhesive slime on its surface. Carpet moss is an entity that behaves similarly to a carnivorous plant. It remains dormant, seeping moisture from the carpet until a wanderer stumbles onto it. Acting like an extremely sticky glue trap, it usually adheres to the feet of the wanderer first, who is then stuck on the carpet moss. The moss then releases what are theorized to be psychoactive spores into the air. When inhaled, it causes intense fear and disorientation, usually causing the wanderer to scramble and lose their balance, falling onto the carpet moss, sealing their fate. Strangely, when the victim has the entirety of its body stuck to the surface, the moss will exude another unknown psychoactive to calm the victim. And some survivors who escape this report intense euphoria and even an aphrodisiac state. This can be so powerful that some survivors sprint back onto the moss and attack anyone who tries to take them away. The carpet moss will then release a powerful digestive enzyme 
enzyme that dissolves everything except the bones of the victim. A telltale sign that a room in level zero has a carpet moss infestation is that there are large scattered collections of mucus latent bones. Who would have guessed that having a bunch of complete human skeletons on the floor would be considered a red flag? Nah, I'm just kidding, I made the carpet moss up completely, but I had you though, didn't I? Today's backrooms mania induced psychotic episode is on level fun. Level fun is similar to that of level zero with its damp piss yellow carpets and walls, but it has some key differences. Level fun basically looks like one of those laser tag birthday celebration rooms, but if you took the uncanny valley factor and dialed it up to 11. You know, plastic chairs, table in the middle, creepy off-brand wall decals, cake that some kid has obviously just been shoving into his mouth with his bare hands that just also happens to be made out of human flesh, the whole nine yards. Wandering around this smells almost as weird as Chuck E. Cheese's party room level are the party goers. Party goers are intelligent and aggressive humanoid creatures that used to be human. They are tall, sinewy, with long, smooth, yellowish, leathery skin. In place of an eyes and mouth, they have bloodied empty sockets and crudely carved smiles, but they can still somehow see and vocalize. They use balloons as distractions and almond water as bait, so if something is weird, that's probably a good indication that it's weird. They can be outrun fairly easily because they can sprint for more than 20 seconds. Actually, I'm not sure if everybody watching this video can sprint for longer than 20 seconds, so who knows, maybe you'll be okay. You'll know if you're spotted because you'll begin to hear a distorted nursery rhyme. The song is actually a cognito hazard and results in whoever hearing it becoming extremely tired and numb to everything. So basically, it won't affect most of us in the slightest. The partygoers are skilled at no clipping themselves or others, so you often don't even know if you've changed levels into their domain. Partygoers use strategy in hunting, where some will chase from behind as the others barricade off exits with the furniture and wait around corners of doorways to ambush prey. The ends of the partygoer's arms have holes that contain retractable fishhook-like claws that they use to latch onto their prey. After breaking the skin, the partygoer transfers a venom to the victim and then retreats like a pussy. The process will first take place in the affected area. You can cure this in the early stages via amputation or using super almond water. If you're wondering what super almond water is, it's the result of intense oversaturation and that kid that always has to top your story with a better made-up story. The skin will begin to become leathery around the marks and spread across the surface of the skin. Blood flow to the hands will stop and they will go numb, turn purple, and fall off. The radius and ulna bones will dissolve and fuse in an incredibly painful process, rendering both arms immobile temporarily. Over the next few days, the victim will develop what looks like bruises that quickly turn into pustules. These will soon pop when the hooks have grown enough from the newly formed compound bone to pierce the surface, revealing a sore-like hole that the hooks can retract into. The victim's hair and face will seemingly begin to melt away like a plastic CVS bag that I left in my friend's oven. The venom degrades any memory of the victim's past life. They basically go full batch at this point and carve eyes and a mouth and begin receiving telepathic communications from the party host that the infector partygoer belonged to. Party hosts are weird fat man baby fetus creatures with a party hat crudely stapled onto their scalp. They're completely immobile with shriveled human eyes and they're often sitting at a table with a human flesh cake with a candle in it. Because of their defenselessness physically, they're often guarded by partygoers. Oh yeah, they telepathically communicate with the partygoers and can see through their eyes. Happy birthday, little guy. Thanks for inviting me. I got you a gift. Today's fever dream of a backrooms cartoon is about level relativity. This level has the same pea-stained carpeting and walls as level zero, but because of the additional anomalous properties, it can hardly be called similar. Level relativity, also known as level 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 level, is a series of stairs and hallways arranged in a seemingly impossible structure that resembles the painting Relativity by M.C. Escher. The laws of nature do not apply on this level the same way it does in your dimension. Here, everything is relative including gravity. Each stairway can be used by wanderers who belong to two different gravity sources. This creates interesting phenomena, such as in the top stairway, where two inhabitants use the same stairway in the same direction on the same side, but each using a different face of each step. Thus, one descends the stairway as the other climbs it, even while moving in the same direction, nearly side by side. In other stairways, wanderers are climbing the stairs upside down, but based on their own gravity source, they are climbing normally. If you jump high enough, you can actually 
change gravity fields and fall down onto other stairs. While this is dangerous and has resulted in a lot of unconventional neck bone orientations for idiots, it can be used strategically to get to some previously inaccessible areas on this level and to escape some of the less physically capable entities. Each field seems to affect more than just gravity, as there have been reported distortions in things such as visual perspective, time, and sexual preferences. If two wanderers in two planes with significantly different timescales are looking at one another, one would appear to be moving as if they were in a time lapse, and vice versa, they look like they were in slow motion. Level relativity is home to several entities, one of which being memory worms. Memory worms live on multiple different levels. They're massive bloated wiggly worms with large teeth that spiral down the length of their entire body. These worms have mind-boggling metaphysical abilities. They hunt based on creating illusions relative to the victim's memories. If you see a big slimy worm and then your reality suddenly dissolves and you're watching your old favorite TV show for the first time in your old house getting nostalgic oral from your ex, <clears throat> thanks. They eat their prey whole, digest it partially, and then give birth to a ton of little wormlings made out of the remains. Like most methods of reproduction, what you would consider gross, this species considers so arousing they'd just pay someone to watch. These wormlings can be smashed up and boiled with almond water to create memory juice. Be careful when collecting these creatures, as too many wormling bites can lead to amnesia and even a vegetative state. Memory juice just gets you high as balls. Maybe it has something to do with your memory. I don't fucking remember. People say it helps you accept your situation in the back rooms and reduce your stress. I know lots of people who do this. You don't have to live in the back rooms to need to drink something to get high as balls to accept your situation. It's just called alcoholism. Wanderers report that it's not addictive and they can stop anytime they want, but also don't check the wiki. An entity that can only be found in level relativity are the staircase mollusks. They may be hard to see at first as they are camouflaged amongst the mucus colored walls and floors. They have thick shells that resemble the wallpaper and a muscular foot like a snail that has a slimy texture similar to the damp semen crusted carpet. They can flatten out against a wall to disguise themselves and then pop into the air like those weird pop things that iDub made a giant one of that you can get as a reward for not biting the dentists more than three times. They can stick to any surface and are incredibly skilled at navigating gravity fields while hunting. They often launch full speed at a wanderer, switching gravity fields in the middle, subsequently accelerating their attack, shattering the wanderer's bones on impact with their thick chitinous shell. Afterwards, the mollusk will sit on top of the victim, its muscular foot oozing a digestive enzyme for a few hours before leaving behind only a spooky skeleton. Mm. Oh yeah, by the way, I made this whole fucking level up because the back rooms has like three cannons at this point. And I was like, fuck it, let's make it four. I mean like memory worms and the worm juice are actually real. They're from the wiki and I plagiarized a little part of this from MC Escher's relativity Wikipedia page but the rest, I was just pulling stuff out of my ass. I had you though, didn't I? What would you do if your friend snorted what you thought was a regular old fleshipede and then wouldn't shut up about how you should really change your lifestyle and fill your kidney with insect eggs? This guy looks like he's struggling. Maybe we should give him a hand, huh? <gasps> and what do you mean I shouldn't empty my entire bank account to throw this tropical telepathic bird a blow and blow party? These are neural isopods, arthropod-like creatures that resemble large jungle centipedes. Instead of a chitinous interior, it has a soft, fleshy, slime-covered exterior to help it slide through tight spaces. They wait in the crevices of the back rooms and latch onto the lower leg of a wanderer before climbing up and attempting to enter the body through an orifice. They prefer to enter the body through the nose, ears, or mouth as it is closer to the brain and it's more easily accessible. Although, they have been reported to go in the anuses, urethras, eat through eyes, flesh, or bone to get to the brain. The neural isopod uses electric stimulation in order to manipulate the host's neurons, controlling its thought and movement. It brings its host to a nest where a swarm of neural isopods lay eggs inside the body, and in a few days, the eggs will hatch and the victim will be slowly eaten alive as a living nursery to grow the babies. They grow up so fast. An adult neural isopod can control you to believe that you are in full control of your actions while it's puppeteering you, and you will willingly go to the nest. On the other end of the spectrum, juvenile neural isopods are only adept enough to roughly control the physical movements of the human body, so they basically make you walk like a stroke victim drunk Frankenstein towards your death while you completely are aware and terrified as to what is happening. While this is reversible, it takes more than just some almond water to do it. In fact, the creature will just drink the almond water from the victim's bloodstream, making the parasite stronger. You need to fully remove this isopod to the brain, and oftentimes attempts in this just end in full 
accidental lobotomy. We got one out of Swampus' set here, and I'm glad he's still alive, but he hasn't been quite the same. I wanna go to the fair! Flumps are nightmarish, pulsating, slithery, formless mounds of arms, legs, and other appendages. Oh god, I'm gonna come- They move by using their haphazardly positioned legs to drag their writhing, fat, grub-like mass across the moist, carpeted floor. While they move slowly when a wanderer is not in sight, this can be dangerously misleading, as they can accelerate to over 20 miles per hour in the blink of an eye. When they see a wanderer, they barrel full speed towards them before extending a long hidden arm that can accost a prey at them from over 20 feet away. It will then pull the victim into the massive limbs where they undergo a gruesome excruciating amalgamation process. Which really isn't that bad at all. This is a rabbit. Hot Topic Cyclops cousin of raving rabbits typically grow to the size of an adult man. This is not the maximum, however, because like some species of reptile, the only growth limit they have is what their nutrition can support. With lots of fresh wanderers, this boy can grow big and strong to almost 16 feet or 5 meters tall. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Rabbits have three legs and a single body structured like a tripod. They have jagged, bumpy exoskeletons looking similar to rotted wood. Their eyes are designed by Neuralink and are able to shine a light into the darkness to help them see. Their mouth has a human-like jaw, but all the teeth inside are sharp canines. Their exoskeletons are made of a two-inch thick crystalline structure that is much more durable than a regular exoskeletal chitin. This effectively makes the rabbit bulletproof, fire-resistant, good at active listening, basically this thing is a cockroach, it doesn't matter if you have a nuke. These creatures are incredibly aggressive, mauling survivors and fully eating them in a matter of minutes, not even leaving a bone behind. This is Jerry. Jerry is what I live for. Jerry is everything. Jerry is love. Jerry is life. Jerry is a small bird that looks suspiciously similar to a parrot. It can control the mind of the person holding it, making it say things like Jerry is everything. All hail Jerry. I'm not gay, but I'd let Jerry peg me. Those controlled by Jerry eventually go missing shortly afterwards, with the parrot eventually reappearing on a seemingly random level to find a new host. Giving Jerry sunflower seeds or almond water will tame Jerry, allowing you to pick him up safely. This will only work with the person who fed Jerry, and anyone else who holds Jerry will be affected normally. With this knowledge, you can weaponize Jerry and use him to your advantage by basically creating a missing person bird trap to get rid of anybody you hate. Let's play a game, huh? One of these I made up on my own, and the other three are from the fandom page. Leave a comment which one you thought I made up below. If you get it right, I'll let you live. Some of you have to be expecting that I'm lying to you at this point. I'll staple a dead snake to your forehead. Today's fever dream of a Backrooms cartoon is about the Shady Gray. The Shady Gray, spelled like an emo kid's online alias, is a collection of incredibly unstable sublevels that are all in black and white and affected by a unique glitching distortion effect. There are five documented levels in this collection. There are three more, but no one knows what happens to the documents or the wanderers that recorded it. The first sublevel is level 00. This level is a jungle affected by the glitchy black and white phenomena that affects all shady gray levels. The trees glitch within one another and all animals appear distorted. Touching these distorted things will lead to death by full body distortion and organ evisceration, but on the bright side, this level has a bestiality fatality rate of 100%. The level has a 12 hour day night cycle, however it is extremely different from the normal 24 hour cycle within the front rooms. Instead of the sun slowly moving across the sky and then crossing the horizon, the sky instantly changes from day to night or vice versa without any warning. During the day there are no entities, but at night they become as numerous as the colonies of bacteria in the swamp ass accumulating in your taint as you watch this. The entities in question are unknown due to the night state of level zero being completely devoid of any light. The only confirmed entity in this section are the howlers because people only know what they sound like and no one knows what the hell they look like. Every time the clock hits 12, it shifts from day to night. To proceed to the next level, all you gotta do is take a branch and draw a pentagram into the mud for some reason. I don't know, dude. I mean, that's what the wiki says. Actually, no, I don't like that. There's no reason to include satanic in influence in the back rooms. It's a hat on top of the additional nine hats it's already wearing. You just, you just no clip out. What do you mean this isn't the bathrooms? Level 1-1 is an extremely unstable, old-timey manor. Much of the furniture is glitchy and distorted, and again, touching it results in full body distortion and organ evisceration. There is one entity on this level known as the Landlord, who looks like a tall, slender man from the 50s in a fedora and business suit, except he has the same glitching as the furniture in the level. Actually, no fuck it, he's just 
literally Slenderman. If he sees you, he will approach you slowly. Attempting to run will result in all doors closing and locking before you can exit. The landlord will continue to approach, claiming you are trespassing to watch him on the toilet. Contact with the landlord results in death in the same fashion as when one touches the furniture. Humans usually either perish when he gets to them or break down one of the doors leading to level 2 too. Level 2 too is a large, thick forest covered in snow. Despite being covered in snow, this level is actually incredibly hot, so much so that wanderers often die of heat stroke or heat syncope. I don't feel so good. Because everything in this level is tinted black and white, sunburns are very hard to see forming, and people often get severe blisters in a matter of minutes if not in the shade. There is one type of rarely seen entity on this level known as the Fallen Angels. They are humanoids with large black wings and horns. They all look to be fatally injured and will mostly just ignore wanderers, but if provoked they will clip wanderers into level 3-3. If you for some reason want to provoke them, simply point out how cliche their entire design is and they'll get super defensive and immediately resort to violence. Level 3-3 is an infinite ocean filled with anomalous time-altering cocks. Clocks. The ocean consists of an incredibly toxic mix of distilled water, mercury, and motor oil. There are three different types of clocks floating on the surface of this ocean. Analog clocks, digital clocks, and grandfather clocks, each with unique anomalous properties. Analog clocks will clip you into level 4-4. Digital clocks will freeze someone in time, usually resulting in them just drowning. And grandfather clocks either age the person into an incredibly elderly person or a fetus, which usually also just results in drowning. There are boats on this level filled with faceless, fat, sunburned tourist guys in grayed out Hawaiian shirts and islands on this level as well, all seemingly having the same blistering weather conditions as level 2 too. Level 4-4 is an expansive gothic city where the glitching of the shady gray becomes incredibly severe. Some buildings are upside down, some are clipped inside of each other, some are floating. All the buildings are locked, but like the skull of those who are unsubscribed, they can easily be busted into. This is basically asking for death though, as the buildings are infested with smilers, skin stealers, and a hostile entity known as the Mangled. The Mangled are skinless human heads that move with a series of spider-like limbs constructed from human bones and muscle tissue. The ends of their limbs are incredibly sharp, and they dig the nubbins into the surface to allow them to climb amongst the skyscrapers. Put your guess as to whether or not they're friendly in the comments below. That's not how the wiki describes them. The streets aren't much better, as you'll probably end up curb stomped and robbed by the violent gangs of faceless people that roam the alleys. The entire level is overcast by the thick gray clouds, making it extremely dark. This makes the level doubly dangerous if you have seasonal affective disorder, aka the depressive disorder that some pessimists named Sad. No clipping here brings you to the last documented level of the Shady Grey, Lost Hope. Lost Hope is the level with the edge lordiest name. Sounds like a goddamn XXX Tentacion wannabe. This is when the stability of the Shady Grey completely disappears. This level resembles the concrete pipe filled maintenance hallways of level 2, except the walls are distorted and wobbling with great intensity. This level is almost entirely undocumented as anyone who touches a surface here has their body ripped apart at the atomic level. The strong friendship bonds keeping their atoms together slowly breaking apart until their entire body is reduced to nothing but floating particles. This process resembles intense radiation damage, except I'm gonna say that it's worse because for spooky. <laughs> Bursters are small, vaguely humanoid, quadruped-like creatures that scurry around the halls of the back rooms. I like to call them pimple chimps. Their back legs are distended to look more similar to a canine than that of a human crawling. The burster's skin is covered in lesions and pustules that are filled to the brim and leaking with acidic fluid. These creatures will stay in the fetal position until another living being happens across them, at which point they will pop their weird gross back pimples all over the victim, spraying their entire body with incredibly potent acid, dissolving them in a matter of minutes to hours. The burster will wait for the victim to succumb to their wounds out of laziness before consuming them. They can also damage themselves with the acid. And like that guy who drowned in his own cum, many of the bursters succumb to their own fluids. Surgeons appear to be a door in a wall that is indistinguishable from the rest of the surroundings unless you are on the arm side. Oh yeah, there's like a buttload of arms on one side. These arms will lie dormant until a wanderer, animal, or other entity passes through the doorway. The arms will then spring to life and restrain the wanderer by their wrists, ankles, and neck 
neck before slicing off the extremities and sometimes the head of the victim with their scalpel-like professionally done acrylic nails. The arms will then skillfully rearrange and sew the victim Frankenstein reanimator style back together in a new strange form. Occasionally, the surgeon will add additional body parts from a slit in the fleshy door frame, which I like to call the extremity hole. It's theorized that this extremitory repository is filled with pieces of former victims left over. In some scenarios, surgeons will combine wanderers with animals or entity parts, forming an entirely new abomination. They are very creative. The victim will somehow always survive, maintaining locomotion abilities in all of their limbs, including any new additional ones. While locomotion is technically possible, it results in extreme agony for the first several days after bodily reconstruction. The surgeon transforms the victim into one of a variety of forms, sometimes quadrupedal, sometimes just a leg and a head, sometimes they shuffle the functions of every hole in your face. Pretty random. Nah, I'm just kidding, I made this up because I'm obsessed with the movie Tusk and people did not vote for me to cover it. I had you though, didn't I? Crawlers are the collective name for all those affected by an anomalous species of fungus native to the back rooms. This fungus is visually similar to something I'm not gonna try to pronounce and just put it on screen. A strain of cordyceps fungi which zombifies insects, and currently has a lawsuit levied against it by the Last of Us development team. This fungus growth is extremely aggressive and the infection is present in abundance on many levels. The crawler fungus can only spread to humans through liquids such as saliva, although it can spread to animals and insects via contact. It thrives in warm, dark, damp places like backrooms, carpets, or that weird space between your crotch and your thigh. This infection will progress, with the mold covering more and more of the organism until it's completely engulfed in it. As the infection progresses, the entity will become more and more aggressive and attempt to spread the infection through biting. In the final stages of infection, victims will have every bodily fluid in their system saturated with spores. And before you weirdos ask, yes, that fluid too, and this does technically mean that it is an STD. Ever hear of the numbed man? The numbed man knows as much about you as you do about it. If you learn his weaknesses, he learns yours. If you learn his strengths, he learns yours. If you learn what he jerks off to, the numbed man is a weak humanoid entity who can only be sensed by those he senses. For this reason, he has destroyed his own senses. He tore out his eyes in order to blind himself. He mangled his nose so that he couldn't smell. He punctured his eardrums to become deaf. He burned off his skin so that he could no longer feel touch. I mean, I, I guess that's pretty metal. He has no way to sense anyone nearby, and thus they cannot sense him either. This keeps him safe. The numbed man is not bound by any floor or physical barriers. But again, you basically have to overpower a confused, disoriented, senseless, old blind man. Only thing is he floats and can walk through walls. See, I learned about him before you did, so he's gotta go through me to get to you. Floating and phasing through objects isn't really considered a power in my species. You actually get special parking if you can't do it. Last time I fought a blind and deaf man, I won. It wasn't even a competition. I absolutely fucking obliterated him. Two for two. Hounds are another quadruped humanoid-like creature with warped and distended limbs to make this style of locomotion more easy. These creatures hatch from goopy weird frog eggs. They have long tangled greasy black basement dweller hair growing from their head and an extremely large mouth latent with sharp teeth. Oh yeah, also claws to match cause they know how to coordinate an outfit. Despite looking like an anorexic, bedridden, dying old man, they are quite powerful and quick. They'll pretty much maul anything that isn't, or sometimes is another hound on sight, until the resulting small red pile either stops moving and or existing. Although, if you just stare these things directly in the eye, their brain kinda shuts down. See, my whole head is an eye, so as long as I'm just like generally facing them, they're gone. There's nothing behind these eyes. Not a single thought. Head. Empathy. Death moths are giant edgy emo moths that inhabit the back rooms. Male death moths are small, kinda dumb, and sometimes even friendly. He a good boy. You're my friend now. Female hot topic butterflies are several feet in wingspan, can spit acid at great speeds, and will attempt to turn anything that moves into a pile of sputtering mush. Like anglerfish, this species is big on that horror movie type femdom stuff. Not much is known about the goth moth other than it looks pretty similar to a normal moth 
moth and it kills people who try to study it. Like regular moths, edgy moths are attracted to light. While this is bad if you hear fluttering of wings nearby and you have a flashlight, you could also just put a torch in front of a wood chipper and solve all your problems. Next up is something designed to be completely unpronounceable, obviously based on HP Lovecraft type spelling. I'm just gonna call it an arachnid cause that's the closest reference creature y'all have. This back room's arachnid is a large spider-like arthropod with 16 legs. While these beings certainly aren't benign, they are slow moving and haven't been observed actively pursuing prey items. As long as you don't stand directly under it like the back room's equivalent of a dodo bird that humans tend to be, you'll probably be fine. Speaking of, these entities generally stay hidden on the ceiling, creating ball-shaped webs and filling them with sedative secretions that while unable to completely paralyze a victim, is enough to greatly dampen a person's thinking capability. It then hangs these balls on the ceiling with additional webbing. It continues to do this until there is prey nearby, at which point it will drop a ball. The effect of the depressant starts and the victim will start to feel drowsy, happy, and confused like they faced a blunt. It then proceeds to drop all of the balls at once, making the target completely unresponsive to any outside stimuli, like a guy passed out in his own vomit. The spider boy then drops down to its prey and proceeds to inject digestive enzymes into the victim before slurping out the resulting slurry. After feeding, it returns to the ceiling and hibernates before setting up its traps once again. Its secretion can be refined into painkillers and other useful drugs. But in the pure state, it induces a psychoactive state that some describe as a psychedelic opiate effect. It can be eaten, refined and smoked, even boofed. I dissolved some of it into a vape juice and got it into a concert once. Next up is the cerebrospinal leech. Like most leeches, the cerebrospinal leech is a blood-sucking parasite. But what else does it suck? Cerebrospinal fluid. It's in the name. Are you stupid? Sometimes I think you just watch these videos because you can't read. Latching on lower points of the spine for a few hours can lead to paralysis below where the leech is latched on. But if left for long enough, it can lead to complete paralysis and death by paralyzing the respiratory system. Despite their pleas to end the pain, we have managed to keep a victim in this state alive on a respirator. Latching directly onto the brain is often lethal in a matter of minutes, as the leech will drain the skull of cerebrospinal fluid ravenously, leaving the victim's brain like a wrung out sponge. As this happens, the victim's cognitive function will decline rapidly before they just seize up and fall over dead. Sometimes the leech will suck with such force that the skull makes sickening crunches as it crumples up like an empty Capri Sun bag. A lot of people have been asking if we're from the back rooms, or if they can try to put us on the fandom or the wiki. I I have two things to say to that. One, I'm not from the back rooms. I just like hanging out here, it's a vibe. Two, I'll say it once, I've said it a million times. I'm not an SCP, I'm not a creepypasta, I'm not a backrooms entity, I just like to pick on them. Why is everyone asking who I am? You shouldn't ask questions that you really don't want the answer to. So how about you just sit back, let your guard down, and enjoy some cartoons, huh? These entities are known as the putrid. They look like a decaying, bloated corpse of a morbidly obese human. The literal embodiment of decay and depravity. Mushrooms, mold, colonies of decomposer bacteria, and insect infestations are very common on the surface of their skin. Their smell is reported to be somewhere in between dead camel and living discord mod. The entirety of this entity's distended gut and body is filled with a coiled and twisted mass of intestines. When this entity opens its mouth, you can see the tip of this pile of intestines resting at the back of its cavernous throat. These intestines are filled with rats, maggots, flies, beetles, and various other decomposer friends that are common in front rooms environments. If you think this is gross, I'd like to remind you that you are constantly covered in microscopic bugs. Don't like it? Too bad, you die without them. If a putrid spots a wanderer, it will frantically wobble its large, uncoordinated mass towards them. It can vomit up some of these decomposers to attempt to subdue the victim. If it can incapacitate or catch up to the wanderer, the putrid will then swallow Follow them whole, where the ecosystem of decomposers inside of its body act like a digestive system, breaking the victim down for nutrients before spreading it throughout the putrid's body. While most of you were likely horrified by the previous description, I'd be willing to bet one of you sickos is confused and ashamed as to why that turned them on. This entity is named Six Arms, and it's attracted to stress. We are painfully well acquainted. Six Arms is a partially transparent creature which manifests as a tall, many-armed shadow. It has more than six arms, but since 
thousand six is as high as the person who discovered this entity can count. That's the name. It is vaguely humanoid and emits distorted noises similar to that of a gas-powered machine. It has been observed moving through walls effortlessly, which may imply it is entirely non-corporeal. The more stressed a wanderer becomes, the more likely six arms will be to pursue them. It's recommended you calm down if you notice a darkening of your environment, which signifies his presence. Because he is pursuing you, calming down may be difficult. It's like how you gotta make yourself big to scare off bears. Like, that is not what I'd expect to work. Honestly, that sounds like the stupidest fucking thing you could possibly do. But everyone who doesn't do that is dead, so... Yeah. Sugar is also effective at repelling it. While this is a useful survival strategy, it's pretty mean to pick on someone for having diabetes. I don't think that's gonna age well. This meat is gummy. That's the title. These are worms that look to be an assortment of regular gummy worms. They crawl around on the ground in a fashion similar to a regular earthworm. After a brief moment of wondering if I wanted to eat a gummy worm I found on top of a dirty wet carpet, that obvious yes led me to discover that these creatures are edible. Not only that, they're pretty damn good. The uncooked ones have a texture and taste similar to raw beef, and the cooked ones taste like a steak. I like them both ways, but unlike the time my human friend and I had a raw beef eating contest, Test and she demonstrated her regurgitation based ranged attack, eating them raw is safe for humans. Despite moving like a regular worm, when dissected they have no internal organs, just more of that gummy stuff that has a consistency similar to animal fat. These creatures come from giant glob clusters of around 200 worms that burst and spread around. People ask why I keep coming back to the back rooms, lots of people think it's just for the money and clout, and while you're not wrong, the real reason I love the back rooms is that there's no police to stop me. Oh yeah, also I pulled that putrid thing out of my ass, it's not a real entity. Do with it what you will. Add it to whichever backroom site that you like, I don't give a shit. Uh, while a trip to the backrooms is never good for someone's sanity, they never really are quite the same if they make it back. This episode in particular may be troubling for those who have issues with mental trauma and gore. This level gets dark on those topics, this will be the only warning. Level 7777, aka Blood Masquerade, looks like a small cozy house from the 90s, with bookshelves lining many of the living room walls. The details are so meticulous that they even get the middle schoolers boogers wiped on the bottom of every surface of the house. One can enter this level if they come across a wet, rotting, termite-filled door with the design of a masquerade mask scrawled sloppily in blood on the front, and blood leaking from under the gap between the door and the floor. The fandom says that the entrances are different, but in my professional opinion, f*** that. The flooring is carpeted wall to wall with an ugly beige carpet, although thankfully it just looks red because it's soaked completely through with blood to the point that it makes a squelch every time you take a step. The walls and ceilings of this house are also completely coated in a thin layer of human juice. When DNA tested, it was revealed that somehow this blood was identical to the individuals currently inside of the level, even if they are uninjured. The windows of this house stare out into a vast empty void that isn't discernible to human eyes or technology. I'd try to make sense of it for you, but it'd be like trying to explain the color blue to a blind person, or pain to someone without nerves, or sex to an incel. The ineffable qualities of something are what make it a true experience. All the windows are locked too because last time I left one open, I had to explain why there was a bright red stain directly below my open 7th floor apartment window and where that lady who definitely was not a sex worker went. The most gut-wrenching part of this level is the blood masquerade cognito hazard effect that level 7777 gets its name from. Immediately upon entering this place, the wanderer is hit with the putrid stench of rotting flesh almost on par with an Arby's establishment. As they step into the level, they will feel the blood pooling on the ground, but just below it, they will feel something squishy, something soft, Something that if you step in the wrong spot makes a sickening crunch. I would advise against looking down, but knowing humans, now that I said it, most of you are more likely to do it, or have already done it. I can't not mention it though, or you'll blame me for not warning you, so whatever, fuck you too. When the person looks down, they will see that the floor is filled with the mutilated corpses of their loved ones. Some missing limbs, some disemboweled, some missing parts to their faces. I feel their pain. I pull my hangnail too far. The most common outcome is that the wanderer will immediately have their psyche shattered, and will lay on the blood-soaked ground before getting dragged down by the mutilated hands of the corpses, offering no resistance as they join the pile of rotting flesh. Dude, I own an original Ed Gein lamp, and even I think that's a bit over the top. If they do not die from this, they will likely violently lash out against anyone in the room before they descend into insanity. The only confirmed ways to end the insanity induced by the blood masquerade effect is via death or power washer lobotomy. One squirt up the nose and boom, section thought is 
is completely gone. And now my mentally incapacitated drooling friend has behavior yet again more aligned with what society deems acceptable. These are not actually the real versions of your friends and loved ones. Just like how if that blood all over the wall actually came from your body, you'd be dead and emptied like a scrunched up juice box. Although this might be hard to stomach when you feel the viscera and blood of your beloved childhood friend squish between your toes. If the person is a psychopath or has made no deep connections in life, they will be immune to this cognito hazard and will not see dead bodies of anyone specifically, just a blood-filled house with a bunch of murdered faceless mannequin people. While this might be disturbing still, at least one of you psychopaths is aroused by this. As someone who constructs cognito hazards, you can tell a lot about an artist from their art, and this entity needs someone to talk to and a hug and to be away from all sharp things for its own safety and for everyone else's. If you like this video and want us to come back to the back rooms and do more sus things, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe with all notifications enabled or I'll find a big stick and hit you until you stop moving. Shout out the inner circle. Love y'all. Three race.